Thanks again for coming to the college research seminar. This is the last one for this year. So I don't know if you saved the best for last or not. <laughs> we have a we'll find out. <laughs> Jeff Fluff is going to introduce. So Jeff being a health policy. Great. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Gloria Coronado as our speaker today. Uh, so, Dr. Coronado is a senior investigator in the Mitch Greenwood Endowed Scientist for Health Disparities at Kaiser Permanente's, uh, Kaiser's Center for Health Research in Portland. Um, and before joining Kaiser, she was a research associate professor at the uh, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in Seattle, and she received her PhD in epidemiology from the University of Washington. And so, I met Dr. Coronado when we served together on the uh, Oregon Health Authority Metrics and Scoring Committee, which sets paper performance measures for coordinated care organizations in Medicaid. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussions about things like how to measure the prevalence of colon cancer screening using paper and electronic medical records. Uh, and that's related to today's presentation because Dr. Coronado's contributions to health services research are centered on enhancing rates of cancer screening among Latinos and other underserved populations. Uh, she's nationally recognized for developing innovative methods to improve cancer screening. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, Russ Rich uh, Glasgow uh, highlighted Dr. Coronado's work as one of the best examples of pragmatic clinical trials. So, welcome. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's actually fortuitous because... Uh, my father-in-law lives, actually my father-in-law and my mother-in-law both live here in Corvallis, and um, it was my father-in-law's birthday a couple of days ago, so get an opportunity to celebrate um, his birthday a couple of days late. Um, but before getting into my presentation, I want to tell a quick story um, about my dad. So my dad was born in Mexico, and he was only 10 years old when his mom left her husband and gathered the six kids to cross the U.S. border from Mexico. The family settled in Texas, and Dad didn't know a word of English. Twice he was held back in fourth grade before he quit school to begin work in the fields. His work eventually brought him to Washington State, where he worked in agriculture, met my mom, and together they started a family. Though we spoke mostly English at home, Spanish was Dad's first language, and it remained the language that he spoke with the greatest of ease. On some Sundays, Dad would phone his mother, sisters, or brothers, and the whole house warmed as Dad spoke Spanish. His words were melodic, with wide-ranging sounds that communicated warmth, emotion, and humor. Como han estado? Which means, you know, how have you been? He would ask with an long and drawn out, as if to underscore his level of interest. Despite Dad's ease with Spanish, he knew very little about the ins and outs of grammar. One Monday evening, when I was in high school, I sat at the kitchen table reviewing a grammar lesson for my Spanish class. I was eager to get some help on my homework from my dad and excited to learn the language that he had mastered. He walked into the room and I said, Dad, how do you conjugate the verb decir? Dad quickly pronounced, I don't understand any of that conjugation stuff. <laughs> I tried to explain. I'm like, Dad, you do. It's like, I say, he says, they say, and Dad stated again in the same matter-of-fact style. Afraid of embarrassment, longing, or lament, he walked out of the room, and I returned to my lesson, and that was that. Having a fourth-grade formal education and speaking English as a second language my dad's experiences match the experiences of many patients who receive care in community health centers. So the purpose of my talk today is to underscore the need for research involving community health centers and rural practices and offer some insight into how research and quality improvement overlap. And it's at these overlapping junctures that can offer the greatest opportunity for evidence-driven care and community-informed policy.
So I'll start by talking about the need for more research in safety net um, practice settings and some of the unique aspects of safety net practices, as well as how my research began um, way back in Seattle um, and how it expanded to the Stop CRC project, um, which is the one that Russ Glasgow talked about, um, and then how we're sustaining it through a new project that's working with Medicaid health plans um, called Benefit. And then I'll talk about what's next for my research. So in terms of the need for research and safety net practices, we know that there's a lot of research that's conducted in academic medical centers and that academic medical centers um, patients don't necessarily represent the community at large. So what's really needed is more research and safety net practices that can, and, and data that can inform patient care as well as policy. This is work that was done by Larry Green and published back in 2001, which is a representation of the entire adult population that's at risk. Um, and as you can see, uh, the vast majority of research is done in university medical centers. And even in, in, in the research that's done um, in university medical centers, it only represents a small portion of the population at risk. And so the vast majority of research is taking place in that small um, black um, square at the bottom right of this figure, and yet there's this much larger population that actually is at risk of um, conditions such as colorectal cancer. A lot of the research that I do is what's called pragmatic research, and it differs from traditional explanatory research in a variety of ways. But in both situations, you start with an eligible population. In an explanatory study, you usually apply a variety of inclusion criteria. Um, so you may exclude people who um, can't show up to your research site. Um, you may exclude people who have mental illness conditions, and so you may not trust their responses on a survey. And you may apply a variety of additional exclusions to kind of capture this you know, research-ready population. And so at the end of the day, because of those exclusions, you end up being able to calculate the efficacy of your intervention in a defined subset of your original population. And that contrasts to pragmatic research, which in general applies a lot fewer exclusions. Um, we typically don't exclude people because of non-response. And at the end of the day, we can calculate the effectiveness in a broad subset of, popula of the population. And as a result, we get practice-based evidence rather than um, you know, evidence that's really about a subset of your population. So what are some of the unique aspects of safety net practices? We know that there are a variety of delivery sites nationwide, that they tend to serve young patients, low-income populations, and populations that have multiple chronic conditions. But in general, they actually lower the per patient costs for healthcare, and they reduce the number of ER visits that a patient might need. And so there are 1,300 um, community health centers nationwide um, that provide care through over 9,000 delivery sites, essentially clinics um, that operate nationwide. Um, across the nation, um, I think 26 million people are served by community health centers. We know that in 2010, about one in three of those patients served by community health centers um, were in poverty. And today, or at least in, in 2015, that percentage is two out of every three. And so they, they serve a growing number of patients who um, have low household incomes. We also know that um, those who are covered by Medicaid um, and those who get care from community health centers have are 19% less likely to receive care in an emergency department. And so this is a really interesting prospect of getting the primary care that's needed. You can reduce the need for emergency room visits. Um, we also know that Community health centers in general um, care for patients who have serious and chronic conditions. And so what you see on the bottom are a variety of chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, mental disorders, and hypertension. And you see the proportion who only have an 8% chance of surviving five years. And so through screening, we can find the early stages of cancer. We can also prevent cancer. Um, in the case of colorectal cancer by removing precancerous polyps during a colonoscopy. 
We know that in Oregon, um, as, as Dr. Luck mentioned, um, I was a part of the, the metrics and scoring committee. And so Oregon is now um, focused on colorectal cancer screening for Medicaid enrollees. And we see that there's an important health disparity. So in general, this is data from 2014 showing that about half of the Medicaid enrollees were up to date with colorectal cancer screening recommendations, but only about 20, 28% of Hispanics um, match that criteria. So how did my research begin? Well, when I was in Seattle, um, I began a collaboration with CMAR Community Health Centers, which is a large um, federally qualified health center that operates about 30 clinics in Western Washington. They serve over 200,000 patients. So when you think about Kaiser Northwest, um, they serve about a half a million patients. And so this is a primary care clinic system that serves almost about half as many patients as Kaiser serves here in Oregon. Um, so they're a very large system. They provide primary care to low-income patients. And back in 2010, I began a partnership with them to, to begin to focus on colorectal cancer screening. And so what we did was take a sample of 500 patients. And at that time, um, they didn't have electronic health records. And so we identified patients who were eligible for colorectal cancer by actually looking in the paper charts. Which, which today sounds kind of strange, right? That you would actually <laughs> have to abstract, you know, hard copies of charts to find out if patients were eligible. But that's what we did. And we decided to um, mail out fecal tests to patients who were due. And then in this other group, we mailed out fecal tests and then we followed up with telephone calls and home visits if needed. And what we found is that those patients who got um, the mailing were much more likely to complete colorectal cancer screening than the usual care group and that um, those patients that got the mailing plus additional outreach were even more likely. Um, and so it was a nice little pilot study that, um, that we published and we thought, well, that was fun to do and that was kind of that. But um, when I moved to Oregon about six years ago, I began to think about continuing my work in the, t in the area of colorectal cancer screening. And a collaborator of mine and I were having conversations about how to move the work forward. And it was at that time that this call came out about the collaboratory and doing this pragmatic research. And so we decided that we would pull together an application to you know, propose to do this direct mail program in a larger subset of clinics. And so we'd established a partnership with OCHIN, which as you, many of you know, is a network of community health centers that um, is also a third party vendor of the electronic health record, EPIC. And so you can go to one place to get the data for a whole variety of community health centers in Oregon and beyond. Um, and so we thought it would be great to, um, you know, continue this work or expand it to clinics that were affiliated with OCHIN. Um, and so we started the process of recruiting some clinics. And I have to say that some of those early efforts to recruit clinics um, were a bit discouraging. So I presented this idea at one of the OCHIN provider meetings. And, um, and it was clear that they really didn't, you know, think about colorectal cancer screening that much. And after the meeting, one of the medical directors came up to me and said, you know, colorectal cancer screening is just not something that we're really doing. He said, our patients don't ask about it, and we don't have time to tell them about it. Um, and so it was really clear that um, it wasn't really um, a topic that was on their radar. Um, and so we, despite this, we, you know, like, re like good researchers, you just kind of carry on and <laughs> you try to identify your partners and make your grant application sound as strong as it can be. And so we had, begin we had begun to recruit like individual sites that would participate. And I don't know if any of you have this experience where you're writing a grant and the last couple of weeks feel like you're assembling a plane. <laughs> you're trying to make something happen, but there seems to be a lot of resistance. And, and so it really felt like it was touch and go because we had some clinics that were definitely on board and other clinics that said, well, this sounds interesting, but we really need to take this idea to our board of directors. Um, and so we're not sure if we can really sign on for, you know, in time for your grant to go in. And it was around that time that I was sitting in my office and my phone rang. And, um, and it was somebody from CMAR. And they said, 
remember that pilot that you did way back when on colorectal cancer screening? And, and I said, yeah. And they said, well, we want to know how much that costs because we want to, you know, spread it to our whole network of clinics. And I said, well, that's really ironic because, you know, I'm actually planning, to, you know, I'm writing a grant to do just that in, in a whole bunch of clinics, you know, in the OCHIN network. And so um, they, I said, do you want to be part of this grant? And they said, absolutely. And I got a letter of support within like 20 minutes. And, <laughs> and before I knew it, they were part of the project. And I think they were actually pretty instrumental in getting the project funded because we were kind of struggling to find, you know, a set of 24 clinics who would agree to be part of this. Um, and so that was really an interesting story about how those partnerships um, can really take time to develop um, and, and that you have to kind of wait for when there's that, um, the, the demand, right? Like um, I, I recently went to a national meeting and the guy, um, David Chambers was talking about DNI research and he says, you know, you, you can't sell ice to Eskimos. You have to kind of <laughs> make sure that there's a demand for kind of the interventions that you're offering. And so it was good to know that that demand existed. So we got some funding and we went about the process of um, recruiting clinics within the OCHA network. So at the end of the day, CMAR ended up being um, kind of a, a site for phase two of the trial. And I'll show you some of their data at the end of my presentation. But still the main part of the, of the trial was, gonna, it was going to rely on clinics that were affiliated with OCHA because they shared a single electronic health record. And so we wanted to develop tools um, and use those tools to support this direct mail program. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different aspects of STOP CRC. One is our clinic recruitment efforts, and the other is our plan do study act cycles, um, which really helped us um, engage the, the clinics in an improvement process that they were familiar with. Um, and before I get started, I want to show a quick video about STOP CRC. Um, so for the record, those are not my children. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people see this video and years later they're like, how are your kids, Gloria? I'm like, I don't have kids. <laughs> um, but we had a lot of fun creating that video. And um, the, the great thing is, is that children can be really nice communicators of health information. And I think for colorectal cancer screening in particular, they can say poop when adults really can't. It's just weird the way that works. Um, and everybody understands the word poop, so it works out really well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of, of research um, on different interventions that have been tried. So this is a systematic review that was led by um, Melinda Davis at Oregon Health and Science University. And she looked at studies um, that, that address colorectal cancer screening in underserved and vulnerable populations. And what she found is that essentially the greatest amount of research um, backed the direct mail approach. So mailing fecal tests to patients' homes was, you know, consistently successful at raising rates of fecal testing. So there's strong evidence to support that. 
The other strategy that seemed to have strong evidence was a flu fit program. How many of you guys have heard of flu fit? Nobody. Okay, so a flu fit program is where a clinic offers fit testing to patients that come in for flu shots. And so it's a great idea because if you have these patients coming in anyway and, um, and they're due for fit testing, it's a great opportunity to, to offer them testing. Um, and so that has been looked at in a couple of studies, and, and there's strong evidence to support that as well, although it's studied. Um, and then the other types of interventions, including you know, improvements in clinical processes, patient navigation, or offering education, either at clinic visits or in the community, have really been met with either moderate, low, or insufficient evidence to support their use. So with STOPCRC, um, we are a large pragmatic study that involves 26 federally qualified health center clinics in Oregon and California, and we're testing this direct mail approach um, to raising rates of colorectal cancer screening. So clinics are randomized to receive either the direct mail approach or usual care. Our intervention is stepwise, um, so we send out an introductory letter to patients who um, are eligible for colorectal cancer screening. And then if the patient has a valid address, and um, then we send out a fit kit. And then patients are excluded if they return their fit kit right away or if they call in to report that they had a prior colonoscopy. And those that remain on the list are sent a reminder postcard. And so these are kind of the three basic steps. Um, we developed electronic health record tools that would provide these lists automatically for patients. Um, so that they could manage their list and work them on a regular basis. And these tools um, created the list and updated them daily. Um, so this was the basic premise of our study. Uh, we were funded by the NIH Common Fund, and we started by doing a pilot at Virginia Garcia. And so this pilot involved um, two different approaches to a direct mail program. And the first one, we called it the automated intervention. We identified about 100 patients that were due for colorectal cancer screening, mailed um, the FIT test to them, sent reminder postcards, and in that clinic, about 40% of them returned them. So we had a really good response rate um, in the clinic that got the automated intervention. And then in the automated plus intervention clinic, we um, asked the clinic staff what might be an additional way to improve the response rate. And they said, well, we think that if we delivered a live telephone call to those patients that still didn't complete their FIT test after receiving the postcard, that that will further increase the rates. And so we tried that in this other clinic called the Auto Plus Clinic. And so we identified patients, we mailed them FIT tests, they were sent postcards, and then 30 of them were um, called by phone. And what we see in that clinic is that we got a pretty similar response rate. So that additional phone call didn't seem to further improve the colorectal cancer screening for patients in that clinic. There were a total of seven patients who had a positive fit test result, and all but one of them um, received a colonoscopy um, within nine months. We saw over the course of the study that um, rates um, have increased. And so part of these, are the, these are data from the clinics, and what we see is that Starting in 2010, the rate was 17.7% of colorectal cancer screening overall. And what we've seen are steady increases in colorectal cancer screening up to a 2015 rate of 40, essentially 47%. That happens to be the target for the Metrics and Scoring Committee, or it was at the time. <laughs> I know it's gone up a little bit since then. But what we see is that you know, still the majority of patients are up to date um, because of colonoscopy screening. Um, but we, we see that over the course of the last five years, that screening has gone up for both fecal testing as well as colonoscopy. Um, so I mentioned um, OCHIN already. So I think all you, many of you are familiar that OCHIN is a third-party electronic health record vendor. They were started by Care Oregon that knew that electronic health records were the wave of the future but there are many small community health centers here in Oregon that didn't have the resources to afford their own electronic health record installation. And so the leaders at Care Oregon said, well, why don't we have a shared EMR so that many of these small clinics can get on the electronic health record without having the burden of you know, the, the cost of it. And that way we can make upgrades all at the same time and provide some programming expertise to a whole group of clinics. 
Um, so what we did when we recruited clinics was use a systematic approach, and we've reported on it. Um, and we kind of followed this idea, the reporting, um, the, the approach to reporting on our recruitment of clinics is based on some work from, from Gaglio. Um, so we wanted to present the, the percentage of approach sites that agreed to participate, as well as the characteristics of participating and non-participating sites. We also wanted to report qualitative summaries of notes that were taking, taken during these recruitment meetings with the leadership teams of the clinics. So we started with a list of 41 health centers um, that was provided to us by OCHEN, and we excluded about um, 30 of those health centers, either because of size being too small or geography. So we wanted to include clinics that were you know, somewhere near Portland so that we wouldn't have to travel too far in order to um, deliver our intervention and work with them as part of this project. So after we made those exclusions, there were 11 eligible health centers, um, and three of them declined um, in our process of recruiting. And so we were left with eight participating health centers, which, um, which included 26 individual clinics. So this is how we got there. And so when we looked at some of the quantitative data that gave us an information about the characteristics of these health centers, so these are the ones that were, um, were selected um, inclusion, and the top eight are the ones that participated, and the bottom three are the ones that declined participation. Um, we looked at a variety of factors, including the percent Hispanic, their colorectal cancer screening rate, and the percent un uninsured. And so you can look at the numbers for percent Hispanic, and you, you don't really see any trends. Like in the, among the clinics that declined, they have one of the lowest percent Hispanics, but they also have a health center that has actually one of the highest. And so there's not a clear trend there, nor is there a clear trend with regard to the percentage of patients who are uninsured. Um, but where you see a difference is in their baseline colorectal cancer screening rate. Those clinics that declined participation in general had lower colorectal cancer screening rates than those that agreed to participate. So what this suggests is that those clinics that are already doing stuff, that are already engaged in efforts to improve their rates of screening are more likely to participate in research. And this is interesting because oftentimes, you know, in research, you, um, you're encouraged to, to work with a clinic out of convenience. And so you, you might say, well, you know, I know the medical director at this particular location. I might as well reach out to that medical director or work with that clinic on this particular project, right? So it's typically out of convenience and oftentimes in a grant review, you score more favorably if you have an established partnership with a clinic system. But I think what this information really shows is that you can be introducing some bias in your selection of clinic sites. And that when we think about you know, pragmatic research and practice-based research, ultimately the question is, will this particular intervention work in my clinical system? And so it, it's almost the case that until we can actually include some of those clinics that don't generally participate, can we really reassure people, other clinics, that in fact they would get the same results um, that we got from a given intervention. Um, this is where our clinics are located for our primary analysis. Um, as I mentioned, CMAR is in Washington State, and I'll show you some of their data later on. But um, obviously there's several clinics in Portland itself, um, some near here and some in Eastern Oregon and down by Medford, and then we also included sites in Northern California. So during our leadership meetings with these clinics, we gained a lot of information about reasons why they participated and didn't participate in the study. Um, and we organized these according, from the, according to the model called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. So we thought about kind of factors in the external environment. So for those that participated, they said the colorectal cancer screening is a high priority for their clinic. Um, and in terms of their internal environment, they said that the project would actually help them um, make some needed changes in their system. And so there were some clinics that said, we're about to do a preventive health strategy, and this will actually get us started um, in this broader approach that we want to take to preventive health. In terms of the intervention attributes, they, tend to, they tended to like the fact that there was choice and flexibility in how the program could be implemented. 
So we allowed clinics to either implement it on a monthly basis. Some people wanted to do it based on birth date so that they would mail fecal tests out to patients on, you know, during their birth month. Um, so there were a variety of ways that they could implement the program. And they really felt that the success that we had at Virginia Garcia would support the efficacy of the program in their particular environment. So here's a quote from a, a, pay, a operations director, which is not the same person you see here, just so you know. <laughs> this is a stock photograph. So in research, you can't actually show the, the images of the people that are um, giving you quotes. But um, anyway, this person said, I think national reporting requirements have been influential. However, the local and regional reporting requirements have been a little more influential, especially the CCO reporting requirements. With colorectal cancer screening as one of the CCO measures, it's on everybody's radar. And so this gets back to what Dr. Luck was saying about colorectal cancer screening being an incentivized metric has really created more demand for interventions like stop CRC. So at the beginning, when I was first pitching this study, and I got such a kind of a cold response, it was because I really would need to like sell ice to Eskimos. Um, all of these clinics were going to have um, incentivized metrics coming down the pike. There was going to be 13 new priorities that were going to be put on their, on their table. And if colorectal cancer screening wasn't one of them, it would be hard to get that prioritized within their system. So what were some of the reasons for non-participation? So those that didn't participate generally talked about the cost of testing and follow-up for uninsured patients. Um, and so many of these clinics at the time that we started had an uninsured population that was about 40%. With Medicaid expansion, that went down to about 20% on average for many of these clinics. But it was a big concern to them to offer testing for those uninsured patients. And it was particularly troubling to offer fecal testing to patients who, if they had a positive test result, may not be able to get a follow-up colonoscopy. There are programs you know, that serve this region and Portland region that do a pretty good job of offering that follow-up care for free to patients who lack healthcare coverage, um, but those weren't, um, those weren't heavily used um, at the time that we started. In terms of the internal environment, um, they talked about clinic capacity, so not having staffing in place. Um, sometimes it meant that they didn't have leadership staffing in place or outreach staff that could do this work. Um, some of them talked about competing priorities and in terms of the, the attributes of the intervention itself, some of them had concerns about randomization. And I've heard this one before, and many of you that have worked in clinics maybe may be familiar with this, but essentially um, the clinics want to provide consistent service. And so um, doing this program in some clinics but not other clinics really kind of challenged them to think about their level of comfort in delivering the program to some but not all of their patients. Um, there were some um, clinics that said they had concerns that the program will not work. And so even though they saw the data that we presented from Virginia Garcia, they said, yes, but our patients are different. Um, and that's another common thing that you can hear um, when you talk to clinics, right? No matter how similar <laughs> uh, the patients may be from one clinic to the other, they're still going to feel that their patients are different. Our patients aren't going to respond to something that comes in the mail or our addresses aren't as good for our patients and so forth. Um, so this is an example of, of a, a reason for not participating. So this person said, I think I expressed some disagreement with that part of the design. The reason I said this is because I have a difficult time having a tool that I have access to for one clinic and not be able to offer it to the other clinic. And so this is, again, underscoring that concern about randomization um, because we did develop tools in the electronic health record that we were able to turn on just for our intervention clinics, but not for our usual care clinics. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about with regard to Stop CRC is this idea that um, there's overlap in research and quality improvement. And I think historically we've thought of them as very separate entities um, with kind of defining characteristics is that research creates generalizable knowledge and that quality improvement is about solving a local problem, right? But I think we could agree that there's plenty of research that doesn't produce generalizable knowledge, and there's plenty of quality improvement efforts that, in fact, do, um, or that if that knowledge were more generalized, it could be really useful. 
Um, and so I think that with pragmatic research, as a, we're beginning to understand that there's an overlap between traditional research and quality improvement. And at the, at the center of that could be the processes around quality improvement. And one example is a plan to study act cycle. And how many, by show of hands, how many of you have heard about PDSA cycles? OK, so actually quite a few. So PDSA cycles are a standard quality improvement process um, that clinics generally use to solve a local problem, improvement problem. Um, there are four plan, do, study, act. And so um, somebody said, you can think of PDSA as like a kind of like a baby research project. And so typically, <laughs> typically it's about defining the, the, the problem, um, assessing what the problem is, planning a fix, and then evaluating whether that fix was successful. Um, typically, PDSA cycles are done iteratively. So you might start saying, OK, we need to really think about the workflow around um, you know, this improvement process. And then you might kind of you know, plan something else once you gather data about how successful that workflow was. Um, and so, we, um, so the, the basic premise is that there are a variety of processes within a clinic that involve several different people. And sometimes it can get confusing about who needs what information at what time and at what cost, right? And at the end of the day, it can also be confusing what the, what the end goal is. And so this might be kind of typical within a clinical setting that you need to have multiple departments or multiple entities that are touching either a patient or a piece of information that's relevant to clinical operations. Um, so as part of the STEP CRC project, we decided to use this quality improvement approach. And so we were one of the first studies that said, let's actually use quality improvement methods in order to enhance the implementation of the program. Because we were relying on clinic staff to carry out the intervention, and we had developed these EMR tools that gave them an opportunity to easily identify patients who would be eligible for each step, but we really relied on them to actually orchestrate it. Um, and so we partnered with a quality improvement facilitator who was trained in PDSAs, and we met with the leadership teams of all eight of our participating health centers. We um, prepared a PowerPoint presentation, and we kind of reviewed the PDSA approach. In fact, there was, of our, of our eight participating sites, all, seven of them didn't need much review of PDSAs, and there was one site that said, you know, we're not familiar with this approach, and so we want additional training, and so we offered them additional training. We shared with them some local data, um, as well as EMR data on their screening rates. We had conducted a provider survey and also shared with them some data from the providers within their system. And then we asked them to submit a plan for their PDSA within one month. And so again, PDSAs are generally iterative, but we said we want you to choose one that you will share with us, um, and here's a template that, you, that we want you to complete. And then we asked them to submit their results from their PDSA after three to six months. And each of the sites presented the findings of their PDSA at our advisory board meeting for the project. And so there's a couple examples I want to share about PDSAs. Um, so this one example is, is an example of a, PDSA, a great idea that we decided to make it into a research project. And so this actually came out of um, CMAR, um, who said, you know, we're sending out all these fit kits, and they were sending out like 10,000 fit kits a year which is a huge number, right? They really kind of, you know, were system-wide. And they said, we just want to know what reminders to deliver. So we don't know if this postcard is working OK or if there's something else that we can do to really increase our return rate. And so they identified patients who were due for colorectal cancer screening. They mailed them fit tests. And this was in four, just four of their clinics. And then we helped them randomize patients to either receive a postcard reminder a series of two text message reminders, a series of two automated phone calls, a live phone call where two attempts were made to reach the patient, or combinations of those automated and live approaches. And at the end of the day, we calculated the screening rates in each one of those groups. And so what we found is that um, from our sample of about um, 2,000 patients um, where about two-thirds of them spoke English and a third spoke Spanish as their, as their preferred language. We found that overall, the live phone call um, was the approach that seemed to be most successful. But when we looked at the data 
um, for English, separately for English and Spanish speakers, we saw that for the Spanish speakers, in fact, the combination of the automated and the live call actually resulted in the highest return rate. The other thing to note from these data is that Spanish speakers had a higher return rate on their FIT test than the English speakers did, which is actually a surprise to us because we knew that there was a health disparity. Uh, and based on the previous work that I've done, you typically have to put in a lot of effort um, to get an intervention to work among Spanish speakers. And so a lot of the interventions I'd done in the past involved patient navigation or promotoras or some type of you know, lay health educator that would go out to the community and, and activate people to get screened. And so it was a real surprise to us that this automated system of mailing fecal tests had a higher response in Spanish speakers and English speakers. So why do you think that might be the case? see lots of furrows and people's um, eyebrows. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be one, one explanation is that they're more likely to get fecal testing over colonoscopy, which is something that we do see in the data. Um, the other thing that could be operating here is that they may be offered fit testing during a clinic visit. So oftentimes, if the provider doesn't speak Spanish, has to work with an interpreter and has a variety of things to uh, focus on during that clinic visit, they may not get to focus on colorectal cancer screening. And so the fact that this direct mail program works better in Spanish speakers may have to do with the fact that we're working with a more resistant population of English speakers. Um, and that these Spanish speakers are happy to, you know, in, in general, Latinos have a lot of like trust in their doctor and they're willing to follow a doctor's advice. Um, and, so it, and so it may be that they're very willing to get a fecal test, but maybe they're just not offered it during the clinic visit. Um, here's the same data in a different format showing again that Spanish speakers or those that preferred speaking Spanish had a higher return rate than those who preferred speaking English and that um, in general, the, the combination of the automated and live phone call was particularly effective among Spanish speakers, and the live phone call was effective among English speakers. I think of note, um, it, it, it's interesting to note that even among the English speakers, the strategies that had the lowest return rate tended to be um, written strategies, so text message and the letter, um, which could indicate that there's, you know, it, the issue might be health literacy. Um, and I think the same was somewhat true for the Spanish speakers, although they had a higher response to a letter um, than the English speakers did. Yes? How do you reconcile this with the Virginia Garcia pilot? I mean, it was not exactly the opposite. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, it, yeah, because I, you know, in the Virginia Garcia data, we saw that when we offered, you know, the follow up phone call in, the, in that clinic, that we didn't see a higher return rate. And so all I know is that that was a pilot. So the phone calls were only made to 30 patients. And this was a little bit you know, of a larger study. We included 2,000 patients overall. And so I think that this, in, this data is, is more reliable than the data at Virginia Garcia. But it's a really good question. Um, the other thing to think about is that in Virginia Garcia, um, the lot, you know, it was mostly probably Spanish speakers. Right? And so if you look at the difference between the live call and the letter, you actually don't see a big difference here. It's the combination of the auto call and the live call that really makes a difference. And so right now we've continued to work with CMAR and we're testing the question of like, is it just because there's more attempts to reach the patient? Or if we did the same number of automated phone calls, would that produce the same effectiveness, and the same re return rate? Yes? So you mentioned health literacy. Do you have anything that you Um, there's nothing really in the medical record that indicates, you know, the, the health literacy level of patients, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Did you find any other demographic differences, gender, 
uh, and maybe age or assume these are all over 50? Uh-huh. These are, uh, yes, of course, these are all over 50. Um, we didn't see any important differences with regard to gender. Um, age, age is an interesting one because generally the 50 to 64 population has lower screening rates than the 65 and over. And that has to do with the fact that you're just asked more times to get screened the older you get. And also once patients are 65, if they're residents, they um, can get on Medicare. And so they're encouraged more to get screened at that age. But I, and I don't recall what the data showed on age, but that's a good question. Um, this is an example of the automated phone calls that were used as part of the study. And I'll just play um, one of them. This is Seymour Community Health Center, calling to the line, Michael, about a simple colon test kit your doctor recommended for you. Please mail back your test as soon as possible. Press 1 to confirm that you have received this call. If you have not received the test or if you have questions about the test and would like to speak to Seymour staff now, please press 0 now. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> So that gives you an example of the automated phone calls that were used. So it's a pretty robotic um, system. The thing that I will tell you is that they plan these to be sent out during the day when clinic staff are available to respond to those phone calls. And so they patients could be transferred right away to a clinic staff member to get their questions answered, which was a nice feature of this automated phone call system. So the next PDSA I want to talk about is one that um, was a complete surprise to us. And it revealed an implementation challenge that we did not know existed. And so this is an example from Multnomah County Health Department that said, okay, great, we're gonna do a PDSA. And we wanna do a PDSA on the fact that we're throwing out a lot of completed fit tests. And, um, and we said, oh, what? <laughs> You're throwing them out? And they said, yeah, we're throwing them out because some of them have been improperly collected and in some cases, they're missing the collection date. And we can't so send those on to our outside lab because they won't process them. And so this is a big deal because we're like, a completed fit test is gold. You know, the patient thinks they did the test. They're probably waiting for their results, and those tests are not being processed. And also, like, you know, from a research perspective, we want every single one. And they wouldn't be counted if they weren't resulted in the system. And so what they decided to do was actually count to track the number of fit tests that were being thrown out, either because they were improperly collected or they were missing a collection date. And so the bottom part of the bar represents the number that were missing collection dates. And so then they introduced a new process uh, as part of the plan do study act cycle, and they were able to reduce the numbers that were being improperly collected. Um, and then since then, they've actually decided to switch their fit kit um, in order to further address this problem. But what did they do? So they took their introductory letter, and mind you, this letter um, for them was in English, Spanish, Russian, and Chinese. And they highlighted the section that instructed the patients to include the collection date on their test. And then they also created a new insert that would go in with the FIT test that would give a visual reminder of the need to add the collection date. And so by doing those two things, they were able to cut in half the percentage of kits that were being thrown out. And so this is a really interesting scenario that if we hadn't asked them to do the PDSA, we never would have known that this is a problem. And it's possible that if they didn't do a PDSA, they, they wouldn't have addressed the problem. And so this was a really neat example of the value of PDSAs in research that is pragmatic and that is about you know, making your intervention effective within the context in which it's delivered. So this quality improvement manager said, you know, the PDSA process itself, we kind of do that organically already without calling it a PDSA. So now it's nice to have a form and a template that we can work by so that we can get feedback and come up with questions like, what about if we did this or who's going to do that? So it's good to have that template to work from. So in general, they like the structure that we provided by having them um, do a PDSA. So I want to talk briefly. I know I only have eight minutes to go. Uh, time flies, <laughs> um, but there's a couple of additional topics I want to talk about. The next is sustaining the impacts of the research in clinical practice, and this is where I'm going to touch briefly on the benefit study. So when you think about sustaining programs within busy clinical practices, it's important to think about leadership support, optimizing and focusing your program, creating partnerships 
um, that can sometimes participate in cost sharing, as well as legislation, so incentives and reimbursements. And so I want to talk about the bottom two, partnerships and legislation, um, very briefly. So we know that with Medicaid expansion, Oregon did a phenomenal job in enrolling patients in the Medicaid or the Oregon Health Plan, which is the Medicaid program. Um, they did fantastic job, so did Washington State, and you can see that there are some examples of other states that did not expand Medicaid um, that either maintain their numbers or reduce their numbers um, over the course. Um, we also know that the highest proportionate increase in Medicaid enrollment occurred in those over ages 51 to 64. And so what this means is that, you know, when I first introduced the idea of including colorectal cancer screening as an incentivized metric, in the state's um, CCO program, one of the initial reactions I got is that, whoa, Medicaid? Like, we're for women and children. We don't, we don't cover adults. And I said, well, why don't we check? Um, and the reality is that there were about 20 to 25% of Medicaid enrollees that were eligible for colorectal cancer screening, and that's precisely because of Medicaid expansion. Like, this is the newly insured population of these 50, 50 year olds and older that haven't had insurance for a long, long time. And so this is the value of Medicaid expansion. So I think it created a new opportunity to really address colorectal cancer screening. So, um, so once colorectal cancer screening became an incentivized metric, an incentivized metric um, many of the Medicaid health plans took interest in helping clinics improve their rates of screening. And one of those health plans was Care Oregon, which is a really great system that is headquartered out of Portland. Um, and so we were able to get some funding from the Centers for Disease Control to partner with them to continue with the direct mail program. And so the way that we set it up is that these Medicaid health plans would produce a list of patients who were due based on their claims data. They would send those lists to a print vendor um, that would do all the mailing on behalf of the clinics. And so the biggest issue we had with Stop CRC is that the clinics really felt like they didn't have the staffing to really maintain the program. And so this um, allowed the Medicaid health plans to work with a centralized vendor that would do all the mailing for them. The patient would complete the fit test and those fit tests would go back to the clinic where an order would be placed and the, and the sample would be processed according to the clinic's normal procedures. And so the real benefit of this is not just the cost sharing, which the clinics loved, that they wouldn't have to pay for the staffing to actually assemble all the kits, but they also loved the fact that the kits came back to them because it meant that the data would get back into their records where it could be used for clinical care. And so there's plenty of Medicaid health plans that are like, we're gonna take this over, we're gonna do this centralized program, and the kits are gonna go to our centralized lab, and we're gonna use the fit test that we wanna use. In this scenario, we call it the collaborative model because the Medicaid health plan pays for the same fit test that the clinic is using. And so patients aren't getting one fit test from their Medicaid health plan and a different type of fit test from their provider. So that's one advantage. The obvious other advantage is cost sharing. And the last advantage is that the data stays in the clinical record where it can be used for clinical care. The clinic is on the line for providing any follow-up care that the patient needs, rather than the Medicaid health plan being on the line to deliver clinical care. Um, so that's been really great to kind of uh, fine-tune those ways that we can partner with Medicaid health plans. But apart from this, um, <laughs> there's been some legislation that um, has been passed in Oregon in the last several years. So in 2013, there was some legislation that required that a screening colonoscopy remain a screening colonoscopy even when polyps are removed. And so this is a scenario where a patient goes in thinking they're getting a screening procedure, but a, po a polyp is removed during the exam and they're sent a bill for a diagnostic procedure. And so back in 2013, the Oregon legislature passed legislation to, sh to close that loophole. So a patient that goes in for screening colonoscopy should be able to get that for free as part of the preventive health mandate of the Affordable Care Act. And then in 2014, we helped pass some legislation that was um, promoted by our participating clinics in Stop CRC that was based on their concern that these patients, the patients who got a fit test would get that covered as part of the preventive health mandate of the Affordable Care Act, but that if they had a positive test result, they would then have to pay for that 
there would be copays associated with a colonoscopy. And in general, those copays are about $275. And so in 2014, we were successful in getting some legislation passed that also closed that loophole. And so if a patient needed a diagnostic colonoscopy, that would also be covered um, but for those patients who had healthcare insurance. Um, we also know that Medicaid expansion also was really instrumental, and there's been research out to suggest that it resulted in an 8% increase in early stage detection of colorectal cancer. So I just have a few minutes and I just want to talk briefly about what's next and what's on the horizon for us. So despite all this great work that's being done on colorectal cancer screening, we know that there are still disparities with regard to that follow-up colonoscopy. So among patients who have a positive fit test result, um, many of them are not getting the follow-up colonoscopy. In fact, we see that only about 54% of them are in our data. And the percentage of Hispanics that are getting the follow-up colonoscopy is much lower than the non-Hispanic whites. And so we have been working with um, risk prediction model experts at CHR who are helping us develop a risk score to identify patients who are least likely to get that follow-up colonoscopy so that we can attempt programs like patient navigation on the patients who are most at risk of not adhering. Because what the data show is that the system is currently working for about half of the patients. And if we actually knew how to identify that other half, then we can save a lot of money on patient navigation and actually potentially make it sustainable within these systems. Um, so that, I just want to acknowledge all of my collaborators and take any questions. Yes. I'm curious about, uh, for those who are uninsured and who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, uh, how do you follow up? For example, what's the percentage of them got treatment for the uninsured? What percentage of uninsured actually get treatment for colorectal cancer? Yes. That's a really good question. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know the answer, but I do know that there are programs like Project Access Now in Portland that do provide the diagnostic care and follow-up treatment for patients that don't have insurance. Um, and so those patients could get enrolled through their community health center and then all of their care would be provided through Project Access Now. So it's donated care from Kaiser, Providence, and other sites. Yeah. Yes? Just a minor question. Um, this was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Yeah. The stop PRC and the benefit, are those published? I didn't see the citations yet. They, they are published. Um, we haven't published our outcomes oh, okay. um, yet. We actually don't have them yet, but okay. we've published a variety of things like the recruitment of our clinics, okay. um, the findings from our pilot, okay. um, and a whole like information okay. about our EMR tools. That was just submitted um, okay. yesterday. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It'll be out soon. Um, and then benefit, we're only in the second year. Okay. And so we won't have our data. We're waiting for the colonoscopy claims to come in. So it'll be about another six to nine months before we have our data for our primary analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have a kind of related follow up question, uh, also kind of suggestion. Uh, maybe Great. Maybe consider in the future. Uh, my earlier question was about the uninsured, and it's related to one kind of basic um, ethical issues. Uh, in general, in screening, uh -huh. that is, what's the benefit of screening if you cannot provide treatment? Absolutely. And so, yep. uh, one suggestion: if you might uh, follow up in a follow up study, say, for those uninsured who were diagnosed with uh, heart cancer, are there any benefit even if they do not get treatment at all? Is there a benefit for them knowing that they have yes. colon even cancer, though even though they don't get any treatment? For example, yeah. they might change their diet or change their... their uh, yeah, their right. So, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting ethical concern and, and ethical dilemma. And I think that some people would argue there's still value in the patient knowing that they have colon cancer in the in the case that other people in their family now know that they might be at high at risk and need to get screened earlier. Um, it could be important for them to know in case they have a genetic condition that puts them at higher risk and other family members 
also have that genetic condition. Um, so I think from that perspective, there could still be value. Um, I also think that, you know, and I don't know how many patients are uninsured that have colon cancer and, and struggle to get their medical bills paid for. I mean, it's a really good question. I wish that we had a better way of knowing how often that happens. I think that there probably are efforts either to use Project Access Now or, or to get those patients enrolled in Medicaid if they're eligible. So, yeah, I don't exactly know how often that happens, but I do appreciate the question. So. Yes? Another question. Um, the, you met you, um, one of your uh, slides, you had the, the English and Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if through, uh, I don't know if that would be or, using ocean data, but do, do they have, does the system allow for other social demographic characteristics other than just English and Spanish? And even that, uh, I was wondering if that's how the question is framed. If that's mm. the, you know, their preferred language, mm -hmm. uh, that could be, uh, or, or if it is that they are primarily Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's information, that data is from um, CMAR, which has a different electronic health record system. But language information is typically in the medical record, and it's used mostly for interpreter services. Um, and so a patient who prefers speaking Spanish, the idea is that they probably are needing an interpreter service. So it's not a, a question that's just used to understand their preference. It's really about how to deliver, how to best deliver care to them. Um, and then in terms of like, are there other sociodemographic characteristics um, there are. Sometimes you have um, federal poverty level, which is a proxy for their income, um, and they need to report that in order to, if they're uninsured, in order to figure out their sliding scale, how much they pay for their visits. So we do have federal poverty level. We have insurance status. Um, and then in some, sometimes we're able to link their zip code to census data to get some of the social determinants of health information as well. So food insecurity, housing insecurity, those types of things uh, we can sometimes get from census data. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank you for your wonderful attention. <laughs>